On January 26th, 1933, the Hollywood producer David O. Selznick wrote a memo to his assistant, describing a screen test he had just watched. The memo read, I am uncertain about the man, but I feel, in spite of his enormous ears and bad chin line, that his charm is so tremendous that it comes through even on this wretched test. The man in question was a dancer named Fred Astaire. The 32-year-old Astaire already had a renowned career on Broadway, but tides were shifting in America, and it was clear that Hollywood was where the country's cultural future lay. Selznick spotted Astaire's natural charm and saw his potential to carry RKO pictures into this new world. Meanwhile, a young actress named Ginger Rogers was seeing her star rise in Hollywood. After starting in vaudeville, she moved up to Broadway and then made the jump to the silver screen, appearing in a number of pictures throughout the early 30s, including the acclaimed 42nd Street. RKO thought that Rogers might pair well with Astaire and gave it a shot in 1933's Flying Down to Rio. Rogers and Astaire weren't given top billing, but they stole the show. Tim Satchel's Astaire the Biography, Fred Astaire himself recalled their unlikely chemistry. Ginger had never danced with a partner before. She faked it an awful lot. She couldn't tap, she couldn't do this and that, but Ginger had style and talent and improved as she went along. She got so that after a while, everyone else who danced with me looked wrong. After the success of Flying Down to Rio, RKO decided that Astaire and Rogers should become on-screen partners, an idea that both of them hated. In a 1934 letter to his agent Leland Hayward, Astaire shared his frustrations at the thought. What's all this talk about me being teamed with Ginger Rogers? I will not have it, Leland. I did not go into pictures to be teamed with her or anyone else, and if that is the program in mind for me, I will not stand for it. Astaire and Rogers would go on to do 10 films together, including many of the most celebrated pictures of the era. All of these films were musicals, centered around magnificent dance numbers starring the duo. Astaire was a driven perfectionist, dancing with a precise, aggressive grace that he himself dubbed outlaw style. Rogers was an actor first and a dancer second, yet she looked effortless keeping up with the stare, contrasting his outlaw style with a lighter, more playful approach. As Katherine Hepburn put it, he gives her class, she gives him sex appeal. One of their greatest successes was 1935's Top Hat, which includes the magnificent Cheek to Cheek. In A Stare of the Biography, screenwriter and director Garson Kanan recalled the experience of seeing Top Hat for the first time. Never before and never since have I seen an audience stand up and cheer at the end of a picture. A standing ovation for a movie? I sat through the picture twice, and that evening insisted on going again and taking my brother with me. The next evening, I was back again. Even in the midst of the Great Depression, Rogers and Astaire brought Americans out to theaters in droves. Meanwhile, the music industry was in the middle of a historic collapse. In 1927, record sales across America had reached 104 million. By 1930, they were down to just 10 million. People were unwilling or unable to spend money to listen to music at home, and yet tens of millions were drawn to the spectacle of music and film together at the theater. And so it was that the film industry continued the cultural and aesthetic march toward the creation of the music video as we know it today. Welcome to Hit Record. In the early 60s, a type of visual jukebox called a scopitone started appearing across Western Europe and, eventually, America. These machines have quite the unique story behind them, but we don't quite get to them in this episode. First, we've got to talk more about Fred Astaire, and then we need to talk about Busby Berkeley and Panorams and Elvis Presley and lots more. 
But if you want to go learn all about the Scopitone after this, you can check out the next episode of Hit Record on Nebula right now. Nebula is the streaming service created by and for creators, and the place where every episode of this series will be up two weeks early and with no interruptions like this one. And there's way more beyond that. I'm personally quite excited for Nebula's newest release, a podcast called The Wonder of It All. That show is an exploration into the strange nature of fame and creative success. In it, Harvey Danger lead singer Sean Nelson interviews creatives from all different fields about the conspicuous breakthroughs that changed their lives. The first episode, which features Adam Duritz from The Counting Crows, is up right now, and it's honestly a fascinating listen. If you want to check it out now, you can head on over to go.nebula.tv slash polyphonic. Following that link will get you 40% off an annual premium subscription, and it's also just one of the best ways to support my channel. So why not hit up the link in the description and check it out? Alright, now let's get back to the video. The impact that Rogers and Astaire had on musical film is enormous. Astaire had final say on all of his own choreography, and used that to push a very specific vision of musical film. Astaire's approach was a grounded one. He tried to integrate dance numbers into the plot of the film, and he wanted them shot in as few shots as possible, trying to keep all the dancers on the screen at the same time. Speaking with Film and Theatre Today in 1950, Astaire explained, Either the camera will dance, or I will. This approach is a lot more akin to Astaire's Broadway origins, and it mimics the feeling of watching live theatre and dance. This influence can be seen all over more contemporary music videos, especially those centred around dance, like Beyonce's iconic Single Ladies, or even OK Go's Here It Goes Again. But at the same time as Astaire was working, another approach was developing. This one used dynamic camera movements paired with opulent, large group choreography and preferred elaborate stylization over any sort of realism. To find the origins of that approach, we need to look to one of Astaire's contemporaries, Busby Berkeley. Like nearly everyone else in early Hollywood, Berkeley came up in vaudeville and Broadway. After a prolific career choreographing for the stage, Berkeley found his way into Hollywood in the early 30s and discovered he could make things bigger and more elaborate than anybody had ever dreamed. He was fascinated by geometrics and realized that when you choreograph enormous chorus lines, something spectacular happens. The details of individual dancers begin to fall away and the mass of bodies abstract into striking, visual depictions of music itself. There was almost no focus on the precision or accuracy of the dancers. Berkeley understood that in huge numbers such details faded away, and the sheer mass of human motion seized attentions. He was especially fond of using elaborate single camera shots, swooping his camera through legs, around bodies, and anywhere else that it needed to be. This kind of complex, single-take choreography is something seen all over modern music videos, and these huge dance numbers foreshadow elaborate works by Michael Jackson, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, or Beck. Berkeley's most celebrated work might be 42nd Street, which displays some of his most elaborate choreography, as well as his signature use of cranes for brilliant overhead shots. In contrast to Astaire's approach, Berkeley had little to no interest in integrating his numbers into the plot of the films. In an interview with Kenneth Turan, Berkeley said, I never bothered with the directors who did the dramatic parts of the pictures. Most of the times I'd never even see them. They did their job, I did mine. Of course, my selections were more expensive. We once figured out they cost about $10,000 per minute on the screen, and people yelled about that, but I hollered him down. This single-minded dedication toward creating kaleidoscopic collisions of sound and vision is essential in the progression of the music video. As the Golden Age flourished, Hollywood films veered into surreal territory, and by the late 30s, this was helped by a new addition to the filmmaker's toolkit, color. The earliest version of Technicolor dates back to 1916, but it wasn't until the late 30s that color really started to make its way into film. Famously, The Wizard of Oz literalized this transformation from black and white to color. It used a spectacular, vivid palette that paired perfectly with the jaunty, whimsical music. This foray into fantastical worlds seized the imaginations of America. It pushed filmmaking even further beyond the present and toward the place of abstract stylization that dominates so many music videos. And The Wizard of Oz had more tangible influences too. 
Michael Jackson's first foray into video was 1978's The Wiz, a reimagining of The Wizard of Oz. Nearly all the earliest films to use color were musicals, including Disney's more ambitious animated forays, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and Fantasia. Fantasia, in particular, is a key landmark when it comes to music videos. Unlike Snow White, which is built around a plot, Fantasia is an anthology that essentially consists of eight standalone music videos set to iconic pieces of classical music. The ambitions and experiments of American cinema were peaking in the early 1940s, but the world was plunging into war. This didn't stop the progression of musical films per se, but it created a distinct shift in their tenor. Disney and Warner Brothers both transformed into propaganda arms for the government, producing a number of musical propaganda films, including Der Fuhrer's Face. The music industry started promoting war bonds and creating short reels to send overseas and entertain soldiers. And it's in this dark moment that we see a new technology emerge, one that marks the first attempt at creating a distribution model for music videos. The Panoram was a sort of visual jukebox containing a miniature projector and a loop of film with eight three-minute songs on it, known as Soundies. Panorams could be found in public places across America, and anybody could pay a dime to watch one of these videos. More than anything we've talked about so far, the Soundies themselves are a clear, direct precursor to the music video. Or maybe they're just music videos themselves, it really depends on your definition. They fit most of the criterion we've established, they had both visual and sound, they're clearly repeatable, and they displayed singular art objects not tied to a wider picture, and the addition of visual and sound does create something new in these. Many of these were just straightforward videos of an artist lip-syncing or miming performance, but some even had little conceits and narratives built in. I told the superintendent that you're mighty independent. I wrote you in a letter that you ought to know much better. And now I'm dialing your number. And all I'm gonna talk about is sweet, sweet number. Watching these soundies, they feel a lot like modern music videos. So then why didn't they catch on? Why is the lineage of soundies a weird forgotten footnote? Well, because of the war. The production of panorams required important materials needed for the effort, including rubber. So it was stopped by late 1941, and America had to make do with the existing panoram machine. Still, Soundies held sway over America well into the late 40s, with artists of all sorts making appearances, including the likes of Cab Calloway, Louis Armstrong, and Nat King Cole. Got a penny, penny. Got the telephone, Jimmy. And I just got, just got four cents to my name. The technology that truly spelt the death of the soundie was the same technology that would eventually birth the modern music video. Television. Early televisions existed as experiments and novelty items before the war, but in the post-war economic boom, they became cheaper, more reliable, and more widely available across the Western world. By 1954, more than half of all houses in America had a television, and on the first day of that year, the first standardized color broadcast went out in the US. Similar advances were happening all across the Western world just as a new generation was starting to come of age. Unlike cinema, which was built around longer, more elaborate productions, TV allowed for more flexibility with short-form entertainment. And unlike the Panoram and Soundies, television could be watched from the comfort of your own home. It added a social aspect, as everyone would communally watch things and then gather to talk about them. Whereas with a Panoram, you could really only share it with people who were around the jukebox. Some of the first proto-videos to appear on television were a series of short, pre-recorded performances broadcast in the early 50s called Snader Telescriptions. These telescriptions displayed familiar faces like Cab Calloway, and also highlighted a number of country artists like Tex Williams, Merle Travis, and Bob Wills.
country music in particular thrived on TV in the 50s. Gene Autry brought his singing cowboy character from radio and films into television with a show that ran from 1950 until 1956. The show would see Autry perform musical numbers, making use of the television to create an intimate connection to his audience. Sing me a song of the trail When shadows creep and day is getting long He sings a tender lullaby but even as TV was taking over, musical films were finding life once more in the late 40s and early 50s. The rhythm and blues star Louis Jordan was an early adapter of these proto-music videos. He'd appeared in 14 different soundies throughout the 40s and released a successful musical short, Caldonia, in 1945. Walking with my baby, she got great big feet. She long, lean, and lanky, and they had nothing to eat, but she's my baby. And I love her just the same. After that, he launched into a career of musical feature films. He released a number throughout the back half of the 40s, and these films stand as predecessors to the music video, but also helped create a model for future films by artists like The Beatles. In Hollywood, the post-war economic boom brought on another era of grandiose spectacle. Gene Kelly picked up the tap torch from Fred Astaire, dancing his way into the spotlight in pieces like Singin' in the Rain and An American in Paris. Singin' in the Rain is a particularly interesting film, as the piece itself stands as a meta-commentary on the introduction of sound to film, looking back at the early days of Hollywood with a slightly cynical, nostalgic lens. It wasn't that Astaire had gone away, however. In the later phases of his career, Astaire was still pushing the boundaries of dance. His 1951 number, You Are All the World to Me, from Royal Wedding, is a fantastical piece with creative use of practical effects to make Astaire defy gravity. The room that Astaire dances in in that video is built in an enormous 360 degree rig with all of the furniture glued in place. The rig rotated as Astaire danced his careful choreography to create a spectacular illusion. This no doubt had audiences of the day asking how did they do that, just like people would generations later when watching Virtual Insanity or Denial Twist. The 50s are awash with iconic musicals, each serving as vehicles for beloved stars. Gentlemen Prefer Blondes cemented Marilyn Monroe as a cultural icon, using vivid color palettes and striking visuals that Madonna would pay homage to years later. A Star is Born continued the crossover between the film and music industries, with a musical film about musicians and film stars. And by 1961, a film adaptation of West Side Story was displaying large-scale choreography that would eventually influence Michael Jackson. But there was something else going on in 50s film. Where much of the 30s were about actors and dance stars performing in musical numbers, the 50s saw more and more musicians crossing over into the world of film. The most important of these was Elvis Presley. Elvis was launched into stardom in 1954 when his take on That's Alright introduced much of white America to rock and roll. And while his rise started on the radio, it was television and film that truly launched him into the stratosphere. Elvis's pure, undeniable sex appeal and lurid dance moves enraptured the youths of a new generation. And his rise was clearly tied to his visual performance. When Elvis first appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show on September 9, 1956, the camera was framed above his hips so the audience at home couldn't see the dancing. But he still works it like few could. When he appeared on the show later that year, the camera gives a full view and you can understand why a generation of teenagers fell in love. Elvis' electric stage presence galvanized teens who were hungry to see more of their dreamboat superstar, 
and he was happy to oblige, jumping into Hollywood to create more elaborate visual spectacles. In 1957, Elvis appeared in Jailhouse Rock, a film that has a loose plot about a dancing country singer, but really serves as a vehicle to display Elvis's singing and dancing. The music of that film was released as singles and the title track became a chart topper. And in that way, I think that Elvis's videos are closer to music videos than those of Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly. He's a musical artist using the medium of film to add a visual flair to one of his singles. The entire rock and roll movement was undeniably visual, with artists like Bill Haley, Fats Domino, or Chuck Berry frequently appearing in TV performances alongside elaborate dance numbers. A flood of rock and roll movies of varying quality saturated the market with visual depictions of the day's biggest stars, and many smaller artists who hoped to launch into lucrative careers on the back of the rock and roll tide. The way that musicians were imagining themselves was beginning to shift. There had always been visionaries like Louis Jordan and Cab Calloway who saw the potential of mixing sound and video, but by the late 50s and early 60s, visual aspects were becoming essential to any performer's repertoire. All of the pieces were in place for the existence of music videos. You had the technology to easily combine sound and video. You had a generation of musicians, filmmakers, and on-screen talents who had experimented with that combination. You had color and abstraction. You had several methods of distribution that allowed for short-form content. And to top it all off, you had a brand new musical movement with the financial backing and cultural clout to bring all of these things together. But despite all this, the music video as a medium still had yet to solidify and grab hold of American culture. But as the 60s were dawning, a new generation of musicians and filmmakers were about to change that. We'll learn all about them on the next episode of Hit Record.